it's, it's, yes. it's a literally um, hot topic. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, John, uh, I want to start with you. Okay. So, um, we've spoken a lot about how this is not really so much an economic issue. Yet, when you read all the articles, no matter who uh, writes them, it always um, appears that on both sides, almost all the arguments being made for either staying in or getting out tend to be economical in nature. It always is we're going to lose out there, we're going to win maybe a bit there, maybe Frankfurt is going to gain some uh, on, on the city of London and so on. Um, do you think that maybe the stay campaign completely missed the point that, they, um, that there was an argument to be made to counter the you know, deeper, uh, more emotional um, argument for an, for an exit, and, and what do you think this message maybe could have been? Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that Cameron, it was always going to be very difficult. That was always going to be very difficult for Cameron. Um, of course, I think there are arguments he could have used, and indeed he has started to use them. I mean, it is, if you look at no. his speeches for the last four months, you would say this man is a strong believer in the European project. He thinks that it's very important for our security. He believes it's important that um, if, Bre if Britain were to leave, that might even be a danger for peace in the con on the continent of Europe. Um, uh, that he thinks um, you know, we are much better together, that it's been very beneficial to the UK, not just that getting out would be damaging. But he never said any of this in his previous nine years as leader of the Conservative Party. So I just think it would have been difficult to do. And I'm afraid it also relates to one of the reasons why, why Gisela's picture in the, in the land of Richard Wagner, it would be worthy of a Wagner, a Wagner opera, really, that Britain suddenly decides to come. It will never happen because I'm afraid the British, sadly, and probably for historical reasons, but not only, have never thought like that about Europe. We didn't join the European project because we thought, well, first of all, we thought it would never happen. They would talk and it would never happen. Um, and then it happened. So we said, well, okay, now it's there, but we're still not going to join it because um, it's, it's, it's run by the French. Uh, and it's got agricultural protection and we have links to the whole world. We are a, a global power. Um, we don't need to just concentrate on Europe. And then we discovered that that wasn't such a good idea either. And we needed Europe, so we, we decided we would try and join. And then, of course, we went through the experience of de Gaulle vetoing, vetoing us, which was very humiliating in many ways. And then eventually we got in. But it's always been on the basis that we don't really like it, but we think it's better to be in it than not to be in it. <laughs> and that's been the assumption. Uh, even, I would argue, even, even under somebody like Edward Heath, that was, that was really what the assumption was about. We don't really believe in ever closer union, the United States of Europe. Uh, we don't have an emotional attachment to this project. We are in it because we think it is better for us to be in it than not to be in it. And if that ever changes, we would say, fine, well, let's get out of it. We don't have an emotional commitment to it. And I'm afraid that will always be true, even if we vote to stay in next week. Um, you need always to demonstrate to the British people that, it's, that, they they, that there is a benefit from being in, um, to persuade them to stay in. It's, it, it isn't ever going to be any good to say it is terribly important for Europe. Um, and just as a, another another point that, that was mentioned, um, yeah, I can't remember whether this was um, this was Gisela or or, um, or Gabriel. Um, but the idea that leaders from Europe should say to the British people, "Please will you stay in the European Union because we want you in," and "Please will you stay in because if you don't, if you choose to leave." the whole project might fall apart and we'll get Marine Le Pen in France and, you know, this would be terrible. I, please don't do that. Because, <laughs> uh, because as, and, and I think, for once, I, I am critical of it, but for once I think number 10, Downing Street, has got it right. We don't want European leaders telling us, please to stay in, because it's not helpful. Because as soon as you do that, you are going to increase the people who say, we want to get out at all costs. And if you say, I have said this myself to Nigel Farage, who is the leader of the UK Independence Party, you say, you know, if you leave, if we leave, 
that would be very disruptive for Europe. It might lead to all sorts of problems in the European Union. He'd say, excellent. That's, that's <laughs> and I also said to him in the same interview, I said, you know, it might lead, mean that Scotland decides to become independent. And he'd say, even better, even better. <laughs> so you have to be quite careful with things. And always remember, the British have a very pragmatic view of these things, and they're not very emotional. <laughs> So, so I want to turn this around on the birds a bit from, from a German perspective. If they think about this in, in really um, strategic terms and only think about what, what's best for them, maybe we should quickly assess, both from a, a foreign policy perspective and from an economic perspective, um, how badly would this actually hit us? So we know that the, the birds are obviously um, more engaged when it comes to foreign policy. They have bigger budgets there. They have a bigger core of diplomats all around the world and to some extent obviously Europe benefits from that. So I would like to hear from Gisela how, um, how important are the Brits to us actually um, thinking you know, 10 years out when it comes to you know, rebuilding this kind of capability we would lose. And uh, from Gabriel, um, the, the same question from the um, banking perspective. So, is there actually something to gain for Frankfurt, say, if uh, the city of London um, goes away and vanishes behind a wall of tariffs or uh, different rule sets? Is there something where some people in Frankfurt go, well, maybe not, not the worst idea? Should I start? Yes. Please. I just wanted to add something, if, if I may. I mean, the problem is um, not that the Europeans, continental Europeans, are following or pursuing an integration project out of altruism or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we do it. And I mean, I am German, my husband is French, so you really can be sure both countries did it out of, of very central interests. It's not only a love story or something. No, no, it has become a, I mean, the France-German thing. Not <laughs> it, it was out of, of interest, yeah? France uh, uh, looking for security against Germany, and Germany looking for re-exception in the world after World War II. So it, it's not, you know, idealistic. We have a mindset that is pro-European. Pro the British, and this is included in my thinking as an international relation woman, is that the British have, I think, to understand that being an island, and even no more a real island because of the Eurostar, something in the sea over there, a, a, real, a, a small island in the in towards international politics. It's not a good idea to go it alone. Obama says it. Everybody says it. And this is the point that this this simple this simple um, understanding of international politics of today. It, it's not popular. It's it, it's not popular at all in Great Britain. You know, it's not that they have to love these Brussels institutions. No. To understand their their national interest in a modern way, in a modern way, in an appropriate way. So to come to your question, I mean this is um, in European foreign security and defence policy the big question. What is the as a European foreign security uh, policy without the British? Because the United Kingdom is with France, one of the bigger military powers within Europe and ready to, for example, employ military force where the Germans still have their problems with very good reasons. So there will be um, for sure some kind of loss. I mean, I just yesterday at my university, I received an Indian colleague. We all night discussed about what will happen if Great Britain has a Brexit for India, for example. They are, I mean, they try to get good relations with the European Union. But for them, I think they would really have an identification problem um, if the European Union would be something without Great Britain. So it will be um, real, a, a big loss, but in some points, it will go better without the British. Could you estimate how long would it take for, for uh, continental Europe to make up the loss in capability? What do you think? 
Is this something that takes forever? This is so hard to do, or it's so difficult to answer because I mean, with, in the midst of this present bully crisis, nobody will move, can't move. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if next year and with, for example, the the victory of uh, or the, the defeat of the FPÖ candidate in Austria in these elections. A presidential election, some people say the worst is over. It, Europe will recover. So it depends, you know. I think, but I'm sure that um, the, the, the situation of instability will be tremendous and it will take us a lot of time to, for example, in the security defense thing, to overcome the loss of Great Britain. But in some decision making in some political areas will be easier with the yeah. British. Sorry for this, but I think I this is yeah. the truth. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, if uh, we turn the question around to economics, no, and where uh, losers and uh, maybe winners in, in Germany, so it's easy to see the losers. No? Uh, in the case for Frankfurt, it's much harder to make. But let's start with the losers. Let's start with my own institution, uh, university. No? Uh, all the big research programs that we have uh, that are sponsored by the European Union rely very centrally on partners from Britain. Mm -hmm. In my case, it's uh, very often the LSE or it's Oxford uh, uh, who, who is in. And uh, uh, I don't, you know, it's hard for me to imagine uh, how, how uh, without those teams in we could uh, keep the quality and research that we have today. So what is true for the BMW case is also true for the academic world. We are living in a network and the Brits play an important role there. Not having them and you uh, think would these be... kinds of networks would be cut as well? Well, uh, they are part of uh, the Euro European Union's uh, uh, project. Uh, uh, depending on how the divorce looks like, I mean, if all bridges are cut, this goes away as well. And uh, we had uh, the referendum in Switzerland on this mass migration thing. Uh, and the first thing that happened was that the role of Swiss was suspended in those uh, joint research projects. For eight or so months, we couldn't do anything with them. And then, uh, I don't know what happened, but they came back. So we can now do again uh, uh, Horizon 2020 projects with Swiss participation. But uh, So this is a real danger, just one example. Uh, now, if you think about Frankfurt, yes, it's true that there are certain, you know, bankers who would rather uh, not have the, uh, you know, competition from the very efficient, uh, very well-networked financial center, which is London. And it is clear that uh, under the umbrella of, uh, of uh, more protection, uh, continental uh, financial places uh, could uh, benefit. Also, I think there's uh, France, uh, Paris, Amsterdam, maybe Frankfurt, uh, uh, maybe even Zurich, but what they uh, benefit is certainly uh, much smaller uh, than what uh, Britain would lose and what Europe as such, as such would lose. Europe would lose, it's not about the banks, but rather about the economy as such, would lose uh, the access to the world's biggest financial center. Uh, and, and that is much worse for us than uh, being able to bring back some business uh, to Frankfurt. And it's even worse, uh, I think, under the, under the lobbying that we could expect, uh, it's possible that uh, you know, rules would then be engineered uh, such that uh, we bring business back from London to Frankfurt or Paris. Right? So once we don't have the bridge anymore on board, we can design the banking union or the capital union in a way uh, that repatriates as much business from London to our uh, capital centers, but away from an efficient place to less efficient places, which uh, you know, uh, would, uh, would uh, imply that there should be efficiency losses. There are few other sectors where you know, people would be happy about, uh, about the Brexit. Uh, it's, it's very hard to see them. Uh, there's, if you look at in our simulation studies, if you look across sectors, uh, it's really just the financial sector where there could be some positive effects, but very small. And in all these other sectors, you use financial services uh, in, in their businesses. That would, uh, would, would harm them. So uh, it's, 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 it's really a hard question who actually would benefit from that. There's one group maybe who would benefit. These are you know young uh, bureaucrats in uh, Berlemont. Uh, you know, in the Brussels headquarters, <laughs> who would get promoted faster once they have uh, kicked out uh, the, the, the British competitors. Uh, and the LSE people. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, I, unless anybody has something they absolutely need to get off their chest, I would open it up to the audience and to questions. I'll, I'll take two at a time, I think, otherwise it gets muddled. Big one. Okay. Um, I'll, first of all, I would like to thank the three speakers who have done an excellent job in explaining the different consequences and potential risks that are involved with the potential Brexit. I would like to make one comment and have one, got one question. The comment is on immigration. The numbers that Downing Street normally works with do not separate different parts of immigration. A large part are students and the British universities live of those students. If those students don't come anymore, they've got a really deep problem. Second part of immigration are people from Central Eastern Europe that are working in the service industry. And the service industry <coughs> wouldn't be able to work or to function without those. So that is just a comment on, on the migration issue that has not really penetrated the Middle England uh, part, uh, unfortunately. The question that I have is, I don't know if you are aware of the shooting of a British Labour MP in Leeds today. The man who shot her shouted, Britain first. <laughs> What kind of consequence might Britain first? That's a legend. It's not confirmed. No, it has been confirmed. It was, it was on BBC, challenged. so I, I assume BBC is, is pretty, pretty accurate. Uh, what, co what kind of consequence might that have on the referendum? All right, so the gentleman in the back, and I, I would like you to ask the question and not, we're not going to get into the factual correctness of the statement because I think that's hard for us to ascertain at the moment. Um, I've got a question for John. I mean, you put the sentiment and attitude of a large part of the population of Britain very actually, um, and I'm married to a Brit, so um, I think that is actually absolutely concise. Um, what I was wondering is if there is ever any chance of the British people to embrace a European concept, a European idea. Um, because what, what I find painful is that over 50 million people lost their lives in the Second World War to fight for Europe overall. And I, I feel like it's, it's almost spitting on their graves um, that we throw the idea away, despite all the problems and bureaucracy and immigration and all of that, which I think can be handled. Um, why, what does it take for the Brits to actually realize that they're better off in a larger union, the longest peace time we've ever had in Europe, thanks to the European Union and my... All right, so quickly two questions. One, um, we'll just go with um, violent outbursts, uh, whether, I think they probably, does anybody, uh, does anybody check now? It just sounded from the report as if it was a Brexit person who, who did this, but... I don't know, you can't tell. I mean, it's a bit like the Orlando. But okay, so the, the general Orlando danger of this kind of... Uh, I mean, I have always said, I mean, this is a one-off, it's just one person, and I, she's, I, she's in critical condition, as I understand it. She has done it. She's, gosh, I, I missed that in the last two hours. Um, I doubt if it will make a difference, but there's always been, since the beginning of this campaign, like, I'm afraid, many political campaigns, the fear that, that some incident, more likely a terrorist incident, might um, might might play a role, and I mean, I was more worried about something happening in the Euro Championships, or possibly something happening in London, because it has become part of the debate that immigration, it is claimed by some of the Leave campaign, means we might get more terrorists coming in, you know, from Syria or wherever it is, and so I think there is there there, there was always a risk that that would do it. I think a one-off incident like this, I'd be surprised if it makes a difference. Um, but it might just, yeah, it might just um, help encourage the Labour <coughs> Party to campaign more vigorously for, for the European Union. But I, I, I wouldn't know. The immigration point, um, I mean, of course I agree with you. I, I think it's interesting, and I, I always like to make this point, that the place that has the most immigrants 
in, London, in Britain is, of course, London. Yeah. It's also the place of the most students. Um, and it is the place which has the lowest support for the National Front and is the most enthusiastic <coughs> about staying in the European Union. Um, and actually, the people who say there are too many immigrants in this country tend to come from places where there are often no immigrants. Um, uh, so I think, you know, and I think that is possibly hopeful for the future, uh, which may be part of the answer to your question right at the back. Young people clearly feel more comfortable with immigration and they feel more European than many older people. And the, in the Brexit polls, it's been very clear all the way through that old people want to get out, young people want to stay in. And one of the reasons why people are worried that Leave will win is because old people vote and young people don't. Um, so, and, and that's, that's not the same as populist parties in much of the rest of continental Europe, including, as I understand it, in this country, that, that it's often young people who vote for the populist parties, uh, including the Pegida and, and the AFD. But in Britain, it is old people who tend to vote for the, for the um, UK Independence Party. I mean, the point about the European, will, will Britain embrace the European idea? I've made a couple of comments on it before. I think a lot of people would still say, you know, when it comes to peace and security in Europe, <laughs> we're talking about NATO, we're not talking about the EU. Um, and they don't link the EU with peace and security in, in Europe. I happen to think, and I always make this argument, that the European Union has become part of the foreign policy architecture of Europe. It was critically important in the response to Russia when it invaded Ukraine. Uh, and it's played a, a bigger role in foreign policy in relation to Iran, Somalia, and so on. But most British people don't, either don't believe that or they just don't know about it. And they still think that really what happened after the war was NATO was set up and that's the cause of our peace. And the European Union has nothing to do with it. Uh, and I think you, you find, even in the Leave campaign, and I genuinely think they're I think they are genuine when they say this. They say, we love Europe. We, 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 Nigel Lawson lives in France, you know. Um, <coughs> but we don't equate Europe with the European Union. They try to think of them as different things. But of course it's true, and, and Cameron has made this point, and your patron or your, one of your founders, Brendan Sims, makes this point repeatedly in his books. Um, Britain is a part of Europe. British history is European history. And when Britain has turned its back on Europe, that's always proved a terrible mistake. But it's not always easy to put that across to voters. I mean, when we really take uh, the situation serious, um, this poly crisis, we have uh, um, real, uh, independently from the Brexit topic, we, we must become aware in these dramatic weeks and days and months that something really went wrong with the integration project. Completely wrong. And one of the part is exactly what, what, um, what you addressed. We did, and we, it's, it's real global European, we, we did not succeed to develop some, I mean, this is a political scientist argument, as you will see. We did <laughs> not succeed in developing a narrative which is capable of, for example, creating this kind of consciousness of a common, of a common, um, past, the common present and future, and for example, it's not true that NATO made peace in Europe after World War. It was the European community of coal and um, steel, it was the Franco-German reconciliation, it was not NATO, by the way, created much later. So, and this, uh, I mean, in Britain maybe it's, it's, it's more dramatic than in any other m member state. But when we have this right-wing populism at the moment, in all the member states, it is because we don't have an <coughs> identity-creating um, narrative about European integration history. This is urgently, uh, needed, uh, urgently needed. And we just see that, in fact, this disintegration process, it's only possible, there is no link uh, you know, um, political link or whatever. And so we are falling apart without being conscious that yes, I mean, we have, a, we have a, in fact succeeded in a lot of things. And there is no consciousness and nobody explaining and telling us, so everybody can say sovereignty, sovereignty. I mean, sovereignty in 21st century, it's, it's, I already said it in my uh, little remarks, it's a chimera, as a chimera, whatever it's in English. 
chimera. It's an illusion. It will not work. Uh, if you allow me a very quick comment on this, I, I completely agree that um, we are lacking what um, all these experts keep calling European civil society. But I think that's a chimera as well, because in the end, um, civil society is always a consequence of a state, just as nationalism is a consequence of a nation state. You can't build a civil society without some, um, something that everybody can relate to, like a European government. Civil society can only be there when all the people talk about the same thing in relation to political action that they are affected by. And as long as this doesn't happen, I don't think we will ever get civil society. So I think we need institutions first and civil society first. But just, just a brief aside. Yeah, just, just a brief comment on the question of disintegration in Europe, or also in the United States, it wants to dissociate itself. If, if if Donald Trump gets president from the rest of the world, in it gets creating in the North America, North Korea. But uh, I think the, the you know part of this integration uh, is happening within our societies, and that is I think crucial to understand what's going on politically. Now I, I'm not a political scientist, but uh, there is a lot of evidence of our economies having become more unequal. Now in Germany we see a trend reversal in the last years, but uh, the level is still high. Other countries, Britain, uh, uh, United States, have disintegrated internally and many people uh, feel disenfranchised, feel disadvantaged, unfairly treated, and every single country has its own scapegoat. It may be uh, Europe uh, in, uh, uh, in Britain, uh, it could also be the elite more vaguely, or it could be free trade. I mean, in Germany we have this TTIP discussion. Uh, in Austria, my home country, uh, both of the people who stand in the last round for election at the presidential campaign said, never ever will we sign those free trade agreements. No? Um, so the, I think this, the, the common, there's a common pattern, and, uh, the, the, but it starts with this domestic or national disintegration. And so it should also be, in my view, a part of the solution that we need to propose something, a new uh, social contract or something like that. It gives people more, yes, <laughs> it gives people uh, some more certainty and some more uh, perspectives uh, in their own countries. Free them up to be more liberal also in with respect to relations internationally. All right, I'll take uh, another two to three questions. The gentleman in the white hat. I have a short question to Mr. Pete. How is the discussion within the city in London? What is the point of view of the financial industry in Britain towards a possible Brexit? All right, thank you very much. Yes, please. So, in my observation, it seems that politics has no heart. They don't understand the people, they don't understand the heart of the people, and they try to explain to people, and then you have the populists, and they do, they do, they serve instincts. They don't serve their heart. And look, if you look at Switzerland, it was cited several times. They are a rich country, they don't uh, go to the European Union because they want to be more rich or less rich. No, they don't want to have other kings. So, saying this, uh, now my question is to John. Uh, we had this situation that caused a lot of um, party wars, critics, to the European Union, and now they try to be in favor. So, Mr. Cameron, shouldn't he have resigned some one year ago or something like this? Isn't it a total strategic error that the guy who was criticizing now tries to tell the people, yeah, it's good? Good question. Yes, please. Very quick question. Are there any figures on the anticipated participation rate? I never found any data on that. I don't know, economist, EIU, you must have the data. I think the general situation is that because nobody has ever dealt with this kind of um, election before, there's, they, they just don't know where to start. Usually they know what kind of exit polls they have conducted before when it's parties. They know their usual suspects. They know how to structure a poll, like 75% of age group X is going to vote and so on. And I think <coughs> major polling um, institutes didn't even poll, right? Because they didn't know how to. Is that, you, is that I, yeah, well, should yeah. I start with that one? I mean, yes, yeah. that, no, that, they have asked, actually. They've often asked, um, they've often asked, how will you vote? And then they've asked, will you vote? Um, but it is 
what, what is correct about this referendum is, is the way pollsters, I'm not an expert in polling, but I do talk to quite a lot of them, it's, it's much easier to draw conclusions about an election because you always start with the previous election and you have all the information you have from the previous election. Um, we have, this is not the first referendum we've had, but we haven't had a referendum on Europe for 40 years, uh, so there's no baseline for comparison. Um, I mean, the Scottish referendum had an extremely high turnout because it got very exciting. People were very, uh, there was a romantic view in the Scottish people that some of us would like, some of them would like an independent <laughs> state. And then suddenly, in the last stages, it became very close and there were some polls saying actually they're going to vote to leave the UK. And I think that helped to push the turnout up. So my guess now, and I don't think I have any statistical basis for this, is that the turnout may be higher than people think because it has become extremely close. Um, and I think more people are, are likely to say this is a very serious issue that we ought to vote, whichever way we do vote. Uh, and it is also true that um, registration, the registration process for elections is unnecessarily complicated in Britain, which helps to reduce the turnout. And as everybody knows, we're terribly bad at letting Britons who live abroad vote, mm -hmm. um, which is another defect in British democracy. There are many. Um, but the registration for this referendum has actually risen quite a lot in the last two weeks because, of, because there's been more interest in it, and particularly among young people. So I think the turnout may be higher than people think, which is one of the reasons why I still think in the end Remain might, might just, just do it. <coughs> um, okay, two quick ones. One two, city of London and um, fail strategy just... Well, very, I, very briefly. The yeah, city of London, very quickly, yes. Uh, I mean, with the exception of maybe four big hedge fund owners, the City of London is very strongly in favour of staying in, for obvious reasons, which <laughs> Gabriel spelled out, but many companies in the City of London, including particularly foreign banks, they are there because they have a passport which means they could serve the entire European market, and the reason why Britain gets to clear and uh, clear and settle Euro trades is because the European Central Bank tried to stop them doing it and they took a case to the European Court and they won. Um, and everybody in the City of London knows that if, they were, if Britain was not in the European Union, we would lose clearing and settlement in Euros and, and probably quite a lot of other business. And many of the banks have said um, they will move people, not necessarily to Frankfurt, but maybe somewhere else. So the City of London is, is solid. It's not a big vote winner because if you say to people <coughs> in the country at large. Oh, the city of London is terribly distressed. They might. I'm afraid they all again. So yeah, <laughs> take them down. You know, they caused the problem in 2008. Goldman Sachs is. You know, you, you can imagine what they all say. So it doesn't. It doesn't help with winning the vote. And and yes, of course you're right. I, I don't think I would. I don't think I would actually say Cameron should resign. I mean, I think he always intended to campaign to stay in the European Union, but he has a problem in his party, which is that a large number of members and a large people, large number of his own members of parliament, not just members of the party, um, are Eurosceptic. And his tactic, mistakenly, was to say, well, let's just sort of keep quiet, I'll fend them off, then I'll offer them this referendum, and so on. I don't think he ever wanted to leave the European Union. But of course, he is now in this problem that he has, he and many of his colleagues, including even George Osborne, have spent many years saying how terrible everything is in Brussels, uh, how it is hard for them to turn, turn around and say it's wonderful. Britain is not the only country that does this. Um, I mean, I think there are many countries in Europe who send their leaders to European councils, they agree on something, and then they go back, back home and say, we fought a really hard battle, particularly against the Germans, usually, uh, and we won, and this is terrific, we stood up for our national interests. They never actually say, we've got a good deal that we secured because of Europe. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why the European Union isn't popular in many countries besides Britain. All right, we're almost out of time. So we have one, we'll take one question here and one over there, the young gentleman of the red. There's a lady. A lady. There is a lady. <laughs> okay, uh, I did not see you, I'm sorry. Yes, so, so we take both then. Okay, uh, just a brief one. Uh, this afternoon, uh, the German Spiegel had a report that um, based on experiences in the past, that the um, that roads and the companies had a better feeling uh, about the result of it. And uh, surprisingly, uh, that broke uh, apparently quotes a stay in British yeah. rather than the so betting market. That's true. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, I have one question, one comment. So, first question goes to the professors. Um, what do you think will change in the German politics in Europe, or like for the influence of Germany in European politics? 
um, when Britain leaves. Because if. if. <laughs> um, but, you know, most people say that Germany actually will have a problem um, with, you know, this market policies and everything like that. And then I have one comment for the uh, thing you said about young people and educated people in London who are, um, you know, anti-Brexit and want to stay in. Um, I was just in London a few weeks, a few months ago, and um, met a few friends of mine who are, I would say, highly educated and uh, very much European and travel to Europe all the time. And all of them said that um, they are not sure and they feel confused and that actually they even think of voting for Brexit. And I was completely shocked. I mean, I tried to convince them, but it was quite hard because they said they just don't know who to believe anymore. I know that they read the economists and they play, you know, um, we a lot, but um, after hearing that, I was <laughs> I was quite skeptical um, that you know the betting pool was there. All right, question. And that's the final question after the night. the methods. So, what is your opinion on taking a referendum to make this decision? <laughs> so, obviously, it seems like the president regrets um, taking the referendum in the first place. And um, from a political science perspective, is this like how legitimate is this? And um, from an economic perspective, um, whom would you like to make this decision? All right, one on the betting markets, um, one on the role of Germany post possible if Brexit, and one on the, the mode of actually conducting this. <coughs> I, I start maybe very shortly. I think pro Germany will be in, in a very bad situation, um, I mean, out of a lot of reasons, but with regard to this leadership discussion within European Union. I, you probably you know the last five years with this uh, in political science very strong discussion about the German German hegemony over Europe, Euro crisis, all this, and and um, with regard to these leadership questions, uh, uh, Germany will be in an even worse situation as long as France is, remains weak, even worse, worse than worse. But in fact, I mean. These two um, uh, countries, France and Germany, they all the time pretend to be the uh, motor of Europe, but in, in, in some uh, situations they are both separately very, very fond of the British who, who, avoid, who make them avoid this tete-a-tete -tete all the time between Paris and, and, uh, and uh, Berlin. By the, uh, way. So this is very, very, very complicated. And um, one more argument that it's, they must stay. Please <laughs> remain. And for this um, <clears throat> referendum thing, I mean, um, I'm, I must admit that I am total, totally uh, um, opponent of a referenda uh, on the European level. It is not a good idea. I mean, people, for example, my students, they love referendum because they <laughs> think that it's democracy. <laughs> or in fact, what is happening? Some, how many million British people will have the right to vote at this referendum? How many millions? It must be 40. Let's say 30? No, 40 probably. 40, 40 millions. 40 million people, probably only half of them will go to vote. So 2022, um, let's say 30 million people will decide about the, the destiny of Europe. It is not democracy. So, I mean, we must really come out of this, uh, of this illusion of uh, a referenda. Another point, I mean, <clears throat> when, you talk, when you think of referen a referendum at European level and the damage they made, it's terrific. Look at the French referendum in 2005. Even tremendous, to use a Trump word. <laughs> <laughs> So we must overcome this idea because, I mean, to be very polemic, but the British decide about a lot of aspects of the future of the European Union. We were not asked. Five, 450 million people are not asked. I completely agree, actually. It's a, it's a similar situation like the uh, Ukraine um, yeah. deal and the Dutch deciding they don't want that. It's, it's ludicrous. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so, so I think here is where the economist has not much to contribute. Personally, I, I, I don't like this referenda neither, but I do see the necessity for any European member state, either by referendum or by decision of parliament or by any other means, to be able to exit uh, the European Union if they think this is necessary when their interests are 
to present the European Union as a sort of a prison, no? like the Austro-Hungarian Empire was presented as the prison of peoples. Ah, that wouldn't be a good idea, neither. So um, I'm not sure. I have here uh, a colleague of mine in Edinburgh who is just visiting us now, Robert Schimek. He's He's working with uh, poll data, with poll data, and with betting data, and so on and so forth, to produce a composite index of uh, what the of what uh, the odds of uh, of uh, a Brexit would be. And uh, so this is mostly. So here I have a chart that is just the bets data, actually, on the probability as of today, right? This is from I think 14 o'clock or so today. The probability of Brexit is 44 percent. It has gone up in the last uh, couple of days uh, at the 10th of. Uh, what is it? This should be the probably the 8th of June or so. It was still at the 25, so it has uh, rocketed. Yeah. But it, you see also interesting features here that I didn't expect, particular uh, that uh, the odds or the probability of uh, Brexit actually went down on the betting markets after the Obama visit. Mm -hmm. You know, so many have commented that the Obama actually was counter, this was uh, uh, counterproductive. But on the bets market, it didn't look like that. Then the Lagarde statement, again, people said, ah, she shouldn't meddle, but on the bet, betting market, actually reduced the, the probability of uh, Brexit to 20%. And now it's creeping back, but it's still below 50, so let's hope in the remaining week there is no ugly French referee. Uh, <laughs> Who does something bad to the... Uh, you should just let them to win. Yeah, exactly. You should, you should they never, do that. They never win. And, 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 and the last, the last uh, a thought on the... This was asked uh, by, by you on the... How Brexit would, would shape uh, uh, German politics. I think the positions uh, of, uh, of, of Germany, the, you know, the, uh, the, the ways the Germans think about the economy and how they represent it, uh, by their politicians wouldn't change much. Uh, it's just that the power relations in Europe would be dramatically uh, altered by this, uh, with uh, a weakening of uh, everything, of many things that the Germany stands for. And here is why, where I do really not understand, understand what happened in February, why Germany, who has also a lot of problems with certain aspects of the European Union, uh, for example, with the way that you deal with immigration, why we did not uh, produce something that is more convincing for the uh, British voters. I mean, we, we know that the inclusion principle, for example, that we have in the European Union is a problem. No? It's leading to, it can lead to inefficient migration flows, it can pr uh, produce unnecessary burden to the welfare states. This has been, and economists have been making this point for years and years, and nothing has changed. Now, there would have been a platform to do that and give Cameron something real, but what you got was, was I think, uh, a bit of a disappointment. And that's why I don't understand, you know, knowing this, that we, without the Brits, Germany would be so much weaker, I have a difficult time understanding why Merkel didn't, uh, didn't offer more in February. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, to the betting markets, one thing that John well, yeah, just mentioned very quickly earlier. on the betting. You're, you're right that the betting markets have consistently been different. Um, actually, telephone polls have also given a different result from online polls. Um, I don't think the betting markets are always a better guide than the polls, but they sometimes people say if money is involved, you know. And it is also true that when people have been asked how would you vote, they've often said I would vote to leave, and then they've been asked. Who do you think is going to win? And they say Remain will win. So there is still an expectation that Remain will win, and, and, and the betting markets may be right. But I'm afraid I think Gabriel is also right that the odds have changed a lot in the last week. So you know the last surge is going. It seems to be going in, in the wrong direction. Um, I, I I do agree on referendums. I mean I'm afraid the trouble with referendums is once you've started, you can't stop. Um, and you know we know we know what happens in Switzerland. We know what happens in California. We know what's now happened in the Netherlands. And the Dutch Prime Minister said he wants to stop that. Well, he may find it quite difficult to stop it because once people have got the idea that every treaty has to be approved by a referendum or every association agreement, Austria wants a referendum on whether Turkey could ever be allowed to join the European Union, you, you, you've got a problem. You can't you can't go backwards. Um, I just hope that we can limit the number of times we have referendums. I mean, I actually think it's appropriate to have a referendum on whether to join the European Union, and perhaps it's appropriate to have a referendum every now and then on whether to stay. But I think the idea of a referendum on an association agreement with Ukraine is, is, is absolutely ludicrous. Um, 
And uh, we, the thing about young people, I mean, yes, I, I'm just surprised that you had so many young people who wanted to leave. I mean, what is true is that when this debate started, this perhaps is another problem with referendums, when this debate started in February, every single person said, what I want to be told is the facts. I want to be told exactly what would happen. What, what has the European Union done for us? What would happen if we left? I want everything to be factual. Both sides said, we will give you all the facts. And then, of course, they told completely contradictory things. They said, you know, one said you'd be worse off, one said you'd be better off. They made up the number for the budget contribution, which is completely wrong. They, then one said the National Health Service will suffer. The National Health Service said, actually, it would be, you know, one said it would be better. The trouble with political debates on these things is facts, when you don't know what is going to happen, are extremely <laughs> difficult to put on the table. So you don't, I don't think people in Britain have learnt a great deal about the European Union during these four months, I'm sorry to say. Very hard to make predictions, especially when they concern the future. Yes. Um, so we're way over time, sorry. so we're, we're done. But I want to hear um, just from your own, not only from the numbers you have, but from your own experience, from everything um, we heard today, what is your number? What is your probability? Not, not, not the, not the voting. Not there. It's going to happen by 70 to 30 or 40 to 60. Just the probability of um, Brexit. Just a number, and that's it. And we start with you. Can I say 50? You can say 50 percent. <laughs> Everything's 50 percent. Neither yeah. happens or it I think the British will be very pragmatic and stay in. And the number is. Very, uh, sure it will be very close, uh, 51, <laughs> <laughs> for Remain. So you think, okay, but that's the voting. How, how sure are you? Um, so, I'm sorry, I didn't I get it. What's the probability of them? <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I really can't. I, I have to uh, I put okay. my ideas together because I was on, on another okay. question. Uh, no comment. Okay, uh, final okay, well, I'm not So sure. we have a final number. It will be close, but I, I think the odds still favour remain. Um, and I would still say, although I think the outcome may be something like 52-48, I think I would still say it's 60% um, it's, it's, uh, likely that remain will win. I absolutely agree. I think it's 60. No, it's not as high as that. 60. <laughs> All right, we're done. Thank you. Thank you.